Um, so a little bit about Franco Smith. He is a book reviewer for the Portland Press Herald, uh, which I'm sure you all have seen. His novel, Dream Singer, uh, was a finalist for the Penn Bellwether Prize, and he's a friend of the library. So thanks for being here, guys. Okay. So thank you all for coming. Um, this is a real honor to, to be here at the library, and it's also really a great honor to be here with Bruce Robert Coffin. Um, fabulous Portland native, yes? Mm. Portland native um, and, a, and becoming a very well-known mystery writer. He's got a great series, the uh, Detective Sergeant John Bryan series. And we're going to be talking today about um, his third book in the series, Beyond the Truth. Bruce uh, was on the Portland police force for 37? 20, 28 years. 28 years, started walking the beat, ended up as a uh, detective sergeant, yes. Um, so he knows about what he writes. And uh, he, one of his short stories in 2016 appeared in the Best American Mystery Stories, um, along with there were a couple of other people you might have heard of, Stephen King and Elmer Leonard were also. <laughs> In there, so he's in good company. Um, so we're gonna. I, I'm gonna ask Bruce a dozen questions or so, and then we're gonna have a Q and A at the end. So you be stirred and don't be shy. Um, so let me bring this up. I think I have them in my mind. So um, this is quite a book, Bruce. Uh, this is, I think, your uh, most ambitious and your most densely plotted story. And you pluck from the headlines a handful of major stories in the country today. Um, and this includes cop shootings, drug trafficking, um, help me out, what is it? Uh, immigrant tensions is a big part of the story, and not to give anything away, one of the saddest and most tragic issues in our country today. And so I'm really intrigued. I was really intrigued when I was reading it, but I wanted to ask you this question. What stirred you to roll all these things together in one book? Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, actually, I think um, like all of these the books, I think, and, and anything probably that anyone who writes a series is about, um, they all start with what if. And I think like the rest of us, I have looked on uh, really as, uh, essentially since I retired uh, in 2012 as things seem like they have devolved. Uh, you know, the, the relationship between law enforcement and society is definitely strained. Uh, and I, I look back uh, historically and I, I don't believe it's been this strained since probably the 60s. So for me, I really, I've gone out of my way to not, I, I don't want to be the, the uh, law and order writer, you know. <laughs> I'm not just grabbing things out of the newspaper and then writing a book about them. But I see the same things that all of, all of you do, and I felt like I had a story that was evolving inside of me that needed to be told. And it really, it really stem, stems from uh, the what if. And I saw all those things and I thought, well, what if that happened here in Portland? How would that go? You know, who, who would take which side and who would wait till the answers came out and who would jump the gun and who might try to take advantage of that situation. And that's really the book I wanted to write. So Beyond the Truth was born from that. Beyond the Truth. And what's really intriguing about what Bruce is saying is what if. Um, Bruce had to ask that question repeatedly with, with each of these major um, storylines. And then once he got some clarity on that, he needed to weave all those together, and it just really comes together. It's a fabulous story. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so most readers are appreciative of the fact that, that mystery stories uh, require strong plots, but what makes great mystery stories are great characters, and, and this, is a great, this is a great character. Uh, Detective Sergeant John Bryan, um, He's a cop's cop. He followed the, his father onto the force. He backs up and defends his team. He stands up to brass when they seem selfish or 
totally self-motivated in their own interests rather than uh, the greater community or certainly uh, the members on the force. And one of the things I love about uh, Detective Brian is he can be a cowboy at times, um, but, he, but he never does it out of ego. He always does it because it's the right thing, the right thing to do. And it's one of the things that makes him really a wonderful character. So, I, have to, I just got to jump in. You, sure. you said uh, Brian and, it, and Detective Byron, and my oh, I did that the other day. With my you autocorrect, things. my autocorrect does the same thing when I'm typing the book. All you right. wouldn't believe how many times I've gone back and either that or I'm doing it. I don't know which, but yeah, it's irritating when I do that. I'm thinking it would have been easier if I named him Brian. No, right? Thanks for clarifying, clarifying <laughs> that, Tom. Um, so Beyond the Truth brings to fullness a character, uh, the character arc of John Bryan that began in your first book. And these three books I, I see as um, there's a full arc here. Things that are introduced in the first book uh, are picked up in the second. And then this, I think, is really a coming to fruition. What, is been, what has been the guiding premise or principle in your developing this character? When I created uh, Byron, what I really was hoping to do was to, to shine a light on and to give you, as the reader, uh, a really good glimpse of what it's like to go through an entire career as a, uh, a police investigator. Um, the, the stresses that go along with that, uh, the unhealthy ways that, that many of us, uh, while fighting those demons, uh, tend to cope with that stress, uh, and create a very realistic picture of what it's like to do exactly you know, that job, where he's investigating homicides and violent crime within this city. And in so doing, I, I kind of went against the advice that everybody has advice for you when you first start writing. They all, they all tell you when they find out you're writing a police uh, procedural, and, I, and by the way, I hate that term. It should just be a police mystery, right? Procedural sounds boring. Like, sign up for my class, Procedural 101. Sounds clinical. Doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Very, very. So, but I, I wanted to, uh, to create a realistic character, and the advice I was given right out of the gate was, oh my God, you, you can't write another police detective with a drinking problem. And you can't write a police detective with a marital problem. And I thought, well, then I guess I'm not going to be writing about a police detective. So, uh, so, and I initially did set out to try and follow that advice and, and create uh, a more quirky version of John, and I think he probably would have appeared to you similar to, to Monk. You remember the TV show Monk? Or maybe Dexter, without the serial killing bit. Uh, that's off-putting in a procedural. Uh, and then I realized quickly, if the stories I wanted to tell and the, uh, the information I wanted to put out in creating the story was to be even remotely realistic, then I needed to create a real character. And so I drew largely on the good points and the bad points um, of a number of the people that I worked with over the years and trained me to become a police officer in the first place in creating John Byron. And I felt like um, I, I really, uh, the book before, before the first novel actually, Among the Shadows was the first, and there was a novel before that, uh, Death Watch, awesome, awesome. Awesome book that went right in the drawer after I finished it, um, <laughs> which is where it belongs actually. After I die, they can put it out again as like, was it, go tell the watchman or something, right? Yeah. They'll do one of those. But, um, but I really spent two and a half years writing that first novel. Um, and although the novel didn't turn out very well, it was a chance for me to learn who John Byron was. And he, and I really, I, he breathed life into himself as I spent time with him. And now he's, he's really fun to write. I mean, I spend, spend every day with him, so, and the whole team. And he's a paradigm of virtue. He's got a great marriage. He doesn't drink. Right, right, yeah. No. yeah. Um, he is a great character. One of the, one of the I think uh, Among the Shadows, your first book, is just an amazing book. Um, and the first chapter in that book, I think, is a peerless piece of crime fiction. And one of the things that's important to know is that first chapter is only 250 words long and I was stunned when I was reading through Bruce's books and 
I thought, where's the rest of the chapter? I mean, you're, you're aware when you read it that you get to the end of the, uh, what's going on. But um, what you pulled off there was just really an amazing piece of work. And I was curious to know, I'm sure you dashed that off in an afternoon. So <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about what went into getting that right? I, I really felt like the first, has anyone here read Among the Shadows? All right, quite a few of you. Uh, for those of you who haven't, um, after you leave here, I expect you to go over and see Ari. Um, he's got a stack. Um, I really wanted to, to, in the first novel, I wanted to establish the dominance of my character. I wanted you to, to care about John Byron. I wanted you to want to follow his exploits and see where his life was headed. Uh, and I wanted you to root for him. And I felt like, really, the first book in any series, although Sometimes I tend not to read the first book in a series. I don't know about the rest of you. Um, I do that once in a while. But when it comes to creating a character who, who will actually grow and develop as the series goes on, which is what I am, I'm trying to do with John, I wanted to establish that dominance with the character right out of the gate. And in order to do that, the first book deals heavily with John Byron's history, uh, who he is, who his father was. His father was a Portland police officer before him. When I was thinking up bad things I could do to my main character, I thought, what's worse than making him grow up with a police officer father in the city where his father works? And so, and I had fun with that, so. Um, but I, the first novel really, the history of John, the history of John's father, and how he got to be where he is when we find him, when we first meet him, uh, is what that first novel, Among the Shadows, is really all about. And I knew that if I could capture the reader's attention and um, be, make them enamored with John, that the series itself would, would work. And, and that's really how that works. And I wanted to write that opening scene that grabbed you, not only for the reader, but any, any uh, writers here or wannabe writers here? Look, at, no one ever wants to admit it. And then they'll ask questions about how you write and stuff, so I'll know later on. But they, you know, the first book when you write a series, you're trying to also sell that book to a publisher. And in so doing, you have to write an opening chapter that grabs the reader. You know, that's the kind of book I want to read, too, so that's really what you're after. And in that opening chapter, I wanted to show you a little vignette of something that occurs, something violent that occurs to start this investigation off. And then hopefully, you would read into what I had written and then maybe get it wrong. And that's, that was really kind of the goal. But I want the reader to do that to themselves. I don't want to trick the reader, so... One of the things I won't I won't say much. You said it, it, it starts out violently and it and it does. Um, and I won't say much more about that. But one of the things I really loved about that scene was there's this amazing blend of terror and tenderness. And there's this line about the killer doing this one act with great tenderness. And um, it's. It's gripping and it's chilling at the same time. Thank you. Nicely, nicely done. Um, so along, along the veins of the first book, uh, and, and certainly throughout, lawlessness of cops is a central theme in Among the Shadows. And I think it's an intriguing theme, being given that you're a former cop. Why, why, why this theme? Um. I, I felt like it was something that would uh, rear its head sooner or later in the series. If, you, if I was going to tell honest stories and tell stories about police officers, even fictional police officers, and show them as what they are, which is human beings, um, we're as flawed as everybody else. Uh, in spite of all the training that goes on and all the selection process screening that goes on, the reality is that every once in a while a bad apple will sneak in. And also, after dealing with the worst of the worst over a career, uh, you're rubbing up against evil on a daily basis. Sometimes that also rubs off on the police officers. So I felt like to tell that honest story and to have the stakes really be high enough for John to be invested in this thing and to have it be life-altering, uh, I wanted to use that as part of it. Um, and it's funny because I had, I remember a, a, a reviewer was asking me out of the gate before they even read the book um, whether or not you know, I was just going to be true to police and there'd be no bad cops. And I said, uh, no, I don't think I'm going to follow those rules. I want them to be exciting books. I said, you can't always know who the bad guy is or who the good guy is. 
And I had one uh, reviewer, um, I remember, writers will tell you they don't read reviews, they're lying. Uh, we read all the reviews, actually. Um, and I try to only read the good ones before going to bed at night so that I can sleep. But, but I remember reading one reviewer, and I think it was from Amazon, and uh, the, the gentleman that wrote it uh, referred to me as a traitor for having p bad police officers in the book. So I, I, don't, I think that's more about him than it is about me, but um, yeah, no, that was kind of weird. So I've got that out of the way now, and we can move forward. Yeah, you're moving toward being a patriot now. <laughs> um, a theme that runs throughout all three books is this, in the series is how departmental city politics and the media make the job of being a cop so difficult and so frustrating. What's been the response of former colleagues to your series of books and the way you portray what they do? Um, actually, it's been very positive, uh, which, which I guess in some ways when you read these books, that might be a surprise to you. Um, because of the portrayal that happens and uh, really me showing the reader the stress level and what drives that stress level. Um, and and more, than, more often than not, it's about difference of what the job description entails. Uh, you know, the police versus the media thing has been a long-standing uh, thing that people use and it's a very real thing. And it's not a, it's not, it doesn't have to be a personal issue. Uh, you know, as you might imagine, with three decades almost, um, I, I worked closely with a, with a number of reporters over the years. And some of them, um, I actually felt like that we were good friends. But that didn't change the fact that we actually had different goals in mind. Um, the, the bottom line is, we as police officers trying to work an investigation, try to keep everything close to the vest. It doesn't uh, behoove you as an investigator to allow the information to get out while you're working a case and then possibly get into the hands of the people you're trying to actually, you know, convict for this thing. Uh, and so that's our goal, to try to hold everything tight. And the goal of the, of the reporter, of course, or the television or news reporter, uh, is to come out with a story, to put the information to the people, you know, the right to know. And they want to do that quick. And they want to do it before their competitors get the information. So it's really a question of differing goals. Uh, and the same thing holds true for uh, the upper echelon within the police department. You know, the, no chief becomes chief without having started at the ground level. You know, every chief is a, is a police officer when they first start off. But as you go up through the ranks, you realize that what your goals are and what, the, what your bosses expect from you are not the same thing. And uh, many of them look back that I've talked to, uh, actually that I've read the books, fondly on those earlier days because things change the higher up you go. But I just think that's the nature of the beast in any business. You know, whether, whether you're a doctor or you're a nurse or you're an EMT or whatever it is, or even an attorney, one day you find yourself in charge of the thing and not doing what it was you loved, not doing that first job of investigating or being the street cop. Um, and you suddenly look back and you realize, my God, I've turned into a politician. How did this happen? So I think that's just the reality of the job. And I wanted to portray that in an accurate way, how hard that can be. So Davis Billingsley uh, is a pain in the butt, quite honestly. He is. <laughs> he is. He's a writer. Uh, <laughs> so it, it, this, your comments sort of uh, echo in my, my next comment. Um, you were a good cop. I mean, you were put on special task force, interdepartmental, inner city task force, New England task force. Why aren't you in the chief's office today? <sighs> <laughs> I spent plenty of time in the chief's office when I was still in the job. Um, wasn't always positive either. Um, you know, I really had no desire to do that. Um, I, I think I was one of the lucky ones that actually recognized that I enjoyed being at the lower level more. Um, to me, uh, I actually turned down um, the opportunity to become a lieutenant twice, uh, much to the chagrin of, of at least one of the chiefs at the time. Um, and for me, it was, I really paid attention to what the other people above me were doing. Because remember, we, we all start at the same time, really. And some actually started after me, and then proceeded to go up the rank to lieutenant and captain and all that other stuff. And I felt like um, one of the people that I really admired when I first started with the police department in my first several years uh, was a gentleman by the name of Mike Wallace. And Mike was the detective sergeant who ran the Homicide and Violent Crime Detective Unit. And he was exactly what we all wanted to be. 
Uh, he, he had a very prestigious job, he had a very important job, and yet he never forgot where he came from or who he was. And he always made time for the people that were around him uh, and, and the up and coming people. Uh, and I just remembered that. I mean, we all learn from we all learn from the people we work for, whether they're good or bad. Uh, and, and Mike really had a huge positive influence on me. And when that happened, I kind of felt like the, the, one, the pinnacle for me of my career would be his, his job, which is the job I ended up retiring from. Uh, and I, I think I had no desire to go beyond that. You know, I, I could just see that it was further and further away from the job that I loved, which is getting down and doing the work and um, being part of the team of detectives that actually put these cases together and, and then take them forward uh, to get justice. So. I don't know if this is a question exactly, but um, so my education is as a sociologist, and one of the things I always loved, um, sort of a hybrid uh, writer, um, was uh, participatory uh, uh, cases, um, books that I read, uh, that where somebody goes in, a sociologist goes in and lives, Tally's Corner is one of the classics in the field. Uh, and he, the sociologist went and lived on Tally's Corner on a, in an East Coast city, I don't remember the one, and I don't mean this in any way disparagingly, disparagingly but one of the things I love about your books is you have this ability to have that sharp eye for details and character that take the reader, sort of lifts the hatch down to the cellar into what it's like being a cop. And it's one of the things I think that really makes your story so authentic, and I appreciate that as a reader. Thank you, thank you. Um, it, it's, it's really a, a glimpse behind the curtain at, at how police officers think and how they see the world is, is kind of what I was after. Um, Occasionally, especially in the case of my character, Mike Nugent, who is one of the detectives, uh, it may be a humorous look uh, on things that are occurring, the gallows humor, if you will. But uh, it's really, uh, it's an attempt to try and show the reader what it's like to, to think and be and act like a, a police detective. And I want, I want to, to take the reader on the journey where you feel like you're climbing in uh, beside Diane Joyner or John Byron or any of the other characters, and you're part of the investigation, that they're having the conversation with you, or that they're sharing their inner thoughts with you. I want the reader to feel that. So that's really what I set out to do, and hopefully it's working, so. It's working. I think that um, in your third book, Beyond the Truth, you have a, a very different opening than the first two books, and you do it in situ, which means in situation, right in the middle of something going on. And, and the first book does that, and you're right in the middle of this murder, but it's 250 words, and it's really not. This current book, what it does is you're in the middle of a police situation, if you will. Um, there's been a robbery in Portland, and a patrolling cop is, is in the area, and he spots these two guys, and he runs them down and ends up chasing them through the neighborhood and, and gets them blocked in a, in a, I believe it's an alley anyway, it's a blocked passage. And they climb up on, on this car, I believe, to get over this fence, and one of them turns around and fires a gun. And that's sort of the real heart of the setup for the story, it takes off from there. But I was curious, the next two chapters as well, and even chapter four to a bit, in situ, you go into a very, and I, again, this is not disparagingly, you go through a very methodical walk through what it's like coming to a crime scene and assessing what happened and, and what a detective looks for and what they go about taking care of right in those first moments and then what goes on back at the police station as well. I think that my question is, is it may be an obvious answer, but why did you decide to do this rather than in a, a higher level expository narrative? In, instead, you took us down in, if you will, down into the weeds of police work. 
Um, I think, you know, and, it, and it's really from uh, media, inaccurate media. We all watch uh, the television shows, we all watch the movies, and generally they don't come within acres of, of the way things really work. And my goal in the, the third book, because I had to set the stage for what was coming, is I wanted to, um, I, I had actually mentioned this to somebody, when I envisioned how that first scene was going to open, I wanted to, even more, I think, even more so in Beyond the Truth than the first novel, um, to grab you where you couldn't let go. I mean, anyone here remember seeing a movie where you barely got sat down at the movie theater and suddenly you're, you're squeezing the popcorn bag and you're all tense and you're thinking, oh my God, I can't take two hours of this, right? Um, I was envisioning when I, when I thought about writing the opening scene, specifically uh, the movie Cliffhanger. Did anybody see that with Sylvester Stallone? And he's a rock climbing guy, wears a t-shirt, it's winter time, you know, very realistic. <laughs> but the opening scene, it grabs you. I mean, you, you don't even have a chance to get seated before things go sideways. Um, and the other one I was picturing was uh, uh, Shane Black's characters, uh, which, which w were the uh, impetus for what became the Lethal Weapon movie series. Did anybody here see any of those movies with Mel Gibson and Danny Glover? So the second movie, after we've already got introduced to the characters and we love the characters, the second movie starts off immediately in the middle of a high-speed chase, and they're in Danny Glover's wife's brand new station wagon with wood grain paneling, and they're in a high-speed chase. And Mel Gibson's pounding the roof and trying to talk on the radio and hide his accent, and it is just, it's crazy. There's all kinds of stuff going on. And I wanted to do that because I remembered how that made me feel and I knew the importance of that opening scene. Um, and so that's what I wanted to write. But then after I've given that to you and you've crinkled up your popcorn bag, uh, it's time to take it down. And I wanted to show the reader exactly what it's like to be called into a scene like that where everything has exploded, you know, everybody's all cranked up, things are crazy, it doesn't get any worse than that. And as an investigator, you can't get caught up in that. It's almost like you have to come in and put a cone over yourself and, and literally walk through the scene and try to block out all that stuff. Uh, it, I would imagine it would be very much like trying to pitch in a, in a big game or so, the World Series or something. The crowd's going crazy, everything's at stake, and yet somehow you still have to stay centered and internal and focus on the things that matter and not get caught up in the melee. And that's really what that is about. I wanted to show you how that works, how you take that down, how you have to force yourself to do your job and not get caught up in what everybody else is caught up in. So. Yeah, it's very, it's very effective. Um, that would be the procedural part of that. There it is. There it is. Uh, it, but it's not clinical. Um, <laughs> so one of the things you have a scene in that opening in that opening set of chapters, actually in, in, in the first chapter, um, Brian tells all everybody Byron, else. Byron. Byron, 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 Auto, Byron, Auto Byron, 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 Byron. I'm going to have uh, shirts made. Byron. Um, <laughs> Byron. And Byron tells everybody on his team, I want you all to go, I want, who's not working on something in the moment, I want you to go door to door in this neighborhood. I want you to bang on doors, and I want you to interview everybody, and I want you to get their um, eyewitness account about what happened. And this is what they do. And the reason for this comes out later. He, and he says, I don't want, you know, down the road somewhere, somebody coming out of the woods and saying, well, I was there, and what I saw was completely different. And so we want to have it really na nailed down. So later in the book, there's a... Perez, I think his name is. Did I get it right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> Perez, a uh, uh, new story comes out, media, television, I believe it is, and he says, I was there, and what I saw was these two kids, and they raised their hands in the air, and this cop shot and killed this kid. And I could not help but, th and this creates a firestorm, as you can imagine. This is the headline of the city, and the mayor is screaming, and the chief is screaming, and um, the cops still have to go on and do their job. But I couldn't help but think of Ferguson. I believe it was Ferguson. Yes. So, you draw that out of a distant memory, or were you aware that that was so similar and, and the effect of that? No, I think that was just really, from, from what I was attempting to do, I wanted to show how one incident like that 
happening, happening after the scene that's really unrelated um, how much damage somebody can do um, by making a comment like that. Um, and, and it doesn't matter whether, you know, if, if later on you found out that was true, then it's all for naught. But if, if you find out that wasn't true, it's impossible to walk that back. Once that's out there, it's out there. You know, you've heard it. And so everybody who watched the television news uh, at noontime on that day now believes that that's part of what happened. And so it's ingrained on the psyche of everybody living within the city or everybody that has a vested interest in, in determining how this case turns out. Uh, and it's impossible to take that back. Um, once you've heard it, there'll always be doubt in your mind. And somehow it always seems to be when the correction is finally made, it always seems to be in smaller print. And usually we don't find it. That's the problem. And I think, you know, not, not yes, it obviously did occur in Ferguson, but that was all part of the what if. You know, that, to me, that's one of those things that makes it almost impossible to, to get a fair shake and to do the investigation that needs to be done when the public has already arrived at a, at a decision, a preconceived decision on how things went. Uh, and that makes the job of the investigator very difficult. So. Uh, there's no real way to vet that, so what John was attempting to get those detectives to do was to go out and canvass the entire neighborhood, searching for the, the most elusive person, you know, the most least likely to even have seen it, to nail down everybody. Because once, you know, once you've locked them into statements, you know, the, the, the best evidence is the stuff that they remember that just happened versus what's going to happen when they realize they can get their five minutes in front of the camera. And then everything changes. So. Uh, I, I just thought that was a very accurate way to tell that story and to show the pressure that, that really mounts up quickly as the detectives have to deal with something like that. And you can imagine it totally changed, as it does on the street, it to totally changes the trajectory of what comes after that. Um, you brought this up earlier, and, I, and I'm not going to be able to capture it quite the way you do, but I've always struck by it when you had mentioned it a month or so ago, you say something to the effect, and you, correct me, um, you're better at distilling this, that you never want to lead, you never want to mislead your readers. You want to take them to a certain point and lead them to make their own assessment. And that's your job as a writer to do. Talk about that. I think it's an interesting observation. You know, to me, I think that's the most important part of writing uh, a mystery series. And um, any time I get too close to, to what would be um, easier to figure out, my editor uh, gives me that slap in the back of the head and says, you need to stick with what you do that works so well. Um, if I've written it properly, and it doesn't matter whether we're talking about a short story or a novel, if I've written it well, I've given you what you need to solve the mystery. But I also will play on what I hope are your experiences, your biases, your jumping to conclusions, the, the things that we all do, and get you to guess wrong. Uh, not, I don't want to mislead you. If I've done my job, you will mislead yourself. And then when you get to the end of the book, you'll be like, oh my god, I should have seen that coming. And the example that I love to give is, I, I should be writing movies because that's always my example, but um, the same thing gets done actually better in books, but um, the movie has that visual quality where you can really play with the audience. Uh, M. Night Shyamalan, who I am a huge fan of, uh, another person I'd like to meet at some point, but he did a movie with Bruce Willis called The Sixth Sense. And I don't know if you did what I did. I've watched that movie now probably 15 times to see all the little nuances that he built in. But I loved the fact that he allowed me to mislead myself. And I was convinced that I had been played. You know, the, the one scene that really jumped out at me when, I, when the big reveal happened, and I, I almost said, bullshit, I call bullshit on that. Because I remembered Bruce Willis holding his wife's hand at the dinner table, right, when they were in the restaurant. And I, I was convinced that that's what happened. And then he gives you the little vignettes back to what had occurred earlier in the movie. And as Bruce reaches out to touch her hand, she pulls back. They never actually made physical contact. Because of the way it had been written, I made the link that they were out there and that he was talking with her and all this stuff happened. You go back and look at it and that's not what happened at all. And so, as a writer of mystery novels, I want you to misdirect yourself. I don't want to be doing the cheap trick, you know, like, 
like a bad like a bad one where you know the bad guy shows up in the next to last chapter and there's no way you could have ever solved it. I give you what you need and it's just a question of where you go with it. I think that's always the trick. So, my editor at, at Harper, uh, Nick Amflit, um, always that's how he always judges it. He's he's still scratching his head. He goes, I read these all day long, and he goes, you have fooled me repeatedly on the first two books and I have no idea how you're doing it. He goes, I'm convinced. You know, all right, at page 100, I know who did it. And then he's like, damn it, at page 200, I, now I know who did it. This time I got it. And, it. and it just keeps working that way. So hopefully I can continue to do that. You do it quite well. Thank you. You, you fool me. Um, <laughs> and I'm a, I'm a pretty sharp reader. I mean, that's one of the things I think is so fascinating about the genre is one of the challenges for the reader is to figure out who did it. You know, so... Um, the worst thing is to be able to figure it out somewhere maybe past halfway, but well before the end of the book. That's just, you know, it's like time to end. Um, so I, I love titles of books, and I'm really intrigued by your three titles and one of, a couple of things that I think are really interesting. Um, I talked to earlier about in situ, that you're right in the middle of something, you know, beyond the truth, or among the shadows, or beneath the depths. So I was thinking about this, and it popped into my head that all three of these are prepositional phrases. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> are we to read anything into this in terms of <laughs> the trajectory that your stories are going to take? You know, uh, yes, I guess. the. Uh... The, the, the real answer is that we have very little control over the titles. Um, that's what's one of the lessons. Everything has been a lesson. As this goes on, I, God knows what I'm going to figure out in the next book. But I, uh, I was convinced that I could just name my book and they would publish it and it would be a great title. And I spent all this time thinking about it. The first book, Among the Shadows, was actually written uh, under the name The Reaping. And for those of you that have read the book, it's, it's, it's a real good fit. I mean, it's a very apt title for what the story is about. And then my editor got back to me. Uh, the book was already, uh, I was just waiting on copy edit. So really the first book was, was just about done and I felt like, great, I'm already writing book two. We've moved on. I don't have to think about it anymore. And he got a hold of me and said, hey, we, we don't really like this title. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? I go, it's, it's exactly what the book is about. He goes, yeah, but it conjures up images of supernatural. And this is a mystery book. And I argued. I said, well, yeah, but, you know, to reap means exactly what the book is. He goes, yeah, I know, but, you know, we're trying to sell this, too. It's about marketing. And I thought, okay, now I'm in big trouble. So, you know, and, and to let you know what this felt like, you think about this. I spent all that time writing this book under the reaping. It would be like sending your kid off to the first day of school, right? They get on the bus, and it's, her name is Michelle. And she gets on the bus, and she comes home, and she's all excited with a note from her teacher, and she tells you that they're going to call her Diane. And you're like, what? how do I live with that? Like, seriously, five years, and it's been Michelle. So I'm in full panic mode. This is my baby here, and uh, they're telling me i got to rename it. So I have no idea what to do. It's never happened to me before. So I get a hold of a friend of mine, uh, Al Amanda, who is a, is a great writer, who, a former New York, another transplant up to southern Maine. And uh, I said, what do I do? I, have, I've, I didn't expect this. I'm not prepared for this. And he said, don't worry about it. He goes, it happens to all of us. He said, sit down with your wife, come up with a list of five titles that you like, that you could live with, and just give that to them and let them pick one. And he said, whatever you do, do not send them a title you don't like, like I did, because that's the one they'll pick. <laughs> so we, we came up with this list that we liked, that still, I wanted it to have a double meaning. All of the titles have a double meaning. And Among the Shadows was my favorite, and my wife's favorite. And I thought, well, I'm going to have to play reverse psychology like you do with a kid, right? So I buried it. It was down at number four on my list. <laughs> and then I sent it off to them, and I had to wait. And they had a meeting. Uh, that's what publishers do all day long is they have a meeting. On everything, there's a meeting. I said, Jesus, like the police department was. And they, they got back, and they said, geez, everybody really liked Among the Shadows. And I went, well, that's nice. And I thought, that's it, I'll lowball it so that they don't get too... If they think I'm excited, they may want to change it. So we ended up with Among the Shadows, and I was happy with that. And then I thought, I started having people ask me, so is this going to be the Shadow series? And I thought, oh my God, I stabbed myself in the eye 
than write the Shadow series, because I'm thinking, how many titles could I come up with? You know, in my mind, I'm picturing Sue Grafton, right? I'm, I'm going to have to come up with an alphabet title for every book, and, you know, for those of you that read Sue Grafton, where does the alphabet end now? The letter Y. Very good. So I didn't want to get stuck in that, so I thought I'm going to outsmart these guys. So the second title, um, I, the second novel I wrote uh, with two titles in mind, I couldn't come up with one that was perfect. And I came up with uh, either Beneath the Surface or From the Depths. But neither one of them really did it for me, but I knew that's what I wanted to say. I just couldn't think of any other way to say it. So they had a meeting, and they got back and they said, what about Beneath the Depths? And I thought, okay, I mean, it sounds catchy, and it kind of goes with the first one. What does it mean exactly? Where, where would that be from a quantitative level, you know, below the surface? And he said, it doesn't matter. It just, it goes good, it sounds good. I said, all right, I see where we're at. And then by the third book, I realized that I hadn't outsmarted anybody. I'm now the prepositional phrase uh, author. So that's, you know, Sue Grafton and I, I guess we're, we're locked in, so. But I, I'm happy with that, but it definitely it will be a challenge going forward uh, once you do that. I'm, I'm working on book four right now which is tentatively titled, uh, Within Plain Sight. So, God knows what that'll end up being. Thanks, Bruce. Um, we're gonna open it up to questions from the audience, anybody? At the end of your career as a police officer, did you finally quit to make sure that you could perfect a police officer in a novel because you never could in real life? Wow. <laughs> Can we get security in here? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> that might be the best question I've ever had. That's very good. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Next question. Did you uh, run any of the, any of the early books of, or the later books, any of the books in the series by former colleagues, by uh, trusted former colleagues, just to get their opinion on it? Uh, I really didn't with former colleagues. Um, I have, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. A couple of times I've, uh, Peggy Greenwald, who used to be the chief medical examiner for the state of Maine, uh, Peggy is a good friend and, and we have uh, talked about some things. Actually, she may actually have a bigger role in an upcoming book because she, as the medical examiner, actually is fascinated by cool ways to try and fool the police detectives, you know, as a medical examiner. So uh, that would be the Quincy in her, I guess. And she, we may end up coming up with something that'll be difficult for, for you in future books, but uh, not, not police officers. I, I, I think the first time that I've actually done that where I've reached out and asked for um, some help in regards to the psyche um, was the third book, would be on the truth. Uh, I intentionally got into as the story lends itself to being very, an emotional story. It was an emotional story to write, and it's an emotional story to read. And there were aspects of that that I wanted to get right. Uh, one of the things that I, that I know very well would be investigating uh, police shootings. But I, my limited um, exposure to that was as the investigator following up to find out what happened. But I'd never been the shooter. So I had no idea what that would actually feel like to be the officer involved in that, beyond what I could see. And so I engaged the help of a friend of mine um, who very candidly shared a, an emotional recounting of what, had, what that has been like, what it was like, and what it has been like every day since. Um, and I am forever indebted for them doing that. I mean, they really exposed the whole thing to me. And uh, it was eye-opening, and, and it was needed to tell the story properly. Uh, and then the same thing uh, was done for, uh, with, with me with the, uh, the alcohol part of John's life. I wanted to get a real good, uh, accurate portrayal of what that was like for the person battling alcoholism. And so, I, I, again, I reached out to another co-worker, and uh, they were very candid and very open, and uh, I'm forever grateful. I think it makes it a much better book, so. Thank you. Back in the back. It seems like uh, today's uh, uh, protagonist uh, mystery stories like yours, cop stories, the, uh, the hero always has to be seriously flawed, either, you know, uh, Byron or uh, Paul Darman's uh, Warden, Mike Kordich, or James Heyman's uh, uh, cop, uh, McCabe. Is that become almost an essential portion of uh, putting out, of, of creating a uh, protagonist today about the uh, genre? 
Did everybody hear the question? I'll repeat it back for the camera anyway. Uh, the question was whether or not uh, I, John Byron is very flawed, whether or not um, that, that is a, a necessary component, I think, in, in telling today's stories. And I think it is, um, you know, they don't have to be overly flawed, but I mean, you stop and you think back to the, the classic stuff we were all forced to read uh, back in the day, right? You know, your uh, uh, Shakespeare uh, plays and all your flawed heroes. And, but I, I think that just makes it more interesting. Um, for me, I think it's, a, it's almost a cultural thing where you, where you can't identify with the main character if they're so heroic that they don't, they don't have anything that you can connect with. Um, Jack Reacher, uh, which is the Lee Child series, the reason I think Jack Reacher works is because he is flawed, he is troubled, he is suffering from PTSD. He's brought his career home with him and carries it around uh, as a, an invisible duffel bag. You know, and I, and I think were it not for that component in those, in those stories, Jack Reacher would be, who would care? I mean, he, the only thing missing is the cape and his ability to fly, and we'd be looking at Superman, right, in black and white again. So I think it is necessary, and I think um, I wanted to write John Byron in a way that, that, that people would identify with him. Um, you know, and, and here's another example for you. Uh, the Sopranos was wildly successful. And you stop and you think about The Sopranos, and really, at its core, it's a stereotypical story, a modern-day story of the Godfather. You know, he's, he's running a trash company down in, you know, New Jersey, and it's a front for all this other stuff that's happening. And were it not for Tony's failed things that were going on, you know, he's going to see therapists, he's got anxiety attacks, you know, the guy's a cold, stone-cold killer. But they put ducks in his in his pool and it messes with him and they've got his own guys trying to kill him and that's stressing him out and his daughter's got to get into this high priced college and that's stressing him out and Carm wants a new car and that's stressing him out and suddenly Tony's not a cold blooded killer he's just a guy trying to get by he just happens to be a mafioso boss but I think that's I think that has to happen if we're to connect with a character you know to really care about them there has to be those flawed things that we can all see within ourselves be able to, to enjoy, so. Yes? And even going back in history, I'm sure Sherlock Holmes, the, the great, the wonderful, was an addict, a recluse, um, neurotic, just on and on. Absolutely. There's, there's probably never been a more flawed character than, than that character. Um, and yet we were fascinated by his ability to be able to break down and take apart all these crimes with seemingly unconnected events or clues or evidence and yet there it is he paints a perfect picture for us I mean and if that wasn't if if that wasn't a an engaging character or somebody that we were really uh, enthusiastic about following they wouldn't continue to, to write books about that character they wouldn't continue to make television shows about that character I think that's long-standing I think that's why that works yeah I mean Harry Bosch Harry Bosch is, is uh, very flawed. I mean, that's, that's another example in that uh, regard. Uh, the, there's a difference between the television series and the books where one of them is about his experiences in Vietnam. That's what the series is about, the novels. And then the television version has been updated. So we're talking about Afghanistan and that kind of stuff. But I think the, the thing still holds true. I mean, we all have flaws, whether we are willing to admit them openly or not. We all have them. And so... If, if you paint a picture of somebody who, who really is the, the choir boy and doesn't do anything wrong, no one's going to want to read that. I wouldn't want to read that. So, To, the, to that point, just real quick, um, so I had a, a, a first reader read one of my stories early on, and their comment about the pr protagonist was, he's really boring. So <laughs> that's to the point. You, you ma'am? Yes. Uh, I was just wondering, you spoke earlier about... Um, walking around with the characters in their lives every day. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if there is a character or a sub-character in, in the Byron series um, who's kind of fighting to get out of the box and be your own book. Hmm. You know, you feel that Ooh, I don't know. I guess you, anything's possible. Um, you know, I, I always, it's funny, I think about that stuff. I definitely think about that stuff. Um, because each of your characters, when you spend enough time with them, have their own story to tell. 
uh, and they have their own personality to develop and, and lives, whether they're all on the page or not, they're still there for me. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, who knows? You never know. Um, uh, I, Jim Heyman has done that, and I still have no idea how he did it. Um, as a writer and a reader first, I love to try and analyze something that's, that's unusual that a writer has pulled off effectively. And Jim Heyman's series, uh, set right here in Portland, his uh, protagonist is, is the protagonist of the series, McCabe. Uh, but McCabe is the primary um, detective in the first two books. And Maggie Savage is his really kind of number two. He's sort of my Diane Joyner. And yet, the story he tells in, I think it's book three, actually occurs outside of Portland, Maine. And Maggie is dragged back up north to a county where her father is the sheriff. And, and McCabe really has just a, a small role in that whole novel, and it is the McCabe, it's, it's the Maggie Savage story. And she goes up to investigate the death of a friend of hers uh, from school, uh, and she inserts herself in the state police case, which you might imagine doesn't go over well. Uh, but he, he does it very effectively. It's a great story, and it's, it's almost a seamless transition. And I, I think... To say I would never do that, obviously, I, I wouldn't say, but I think I would have to be much more comfortable with that idea than I am right now. I, I think that's just going to take me developing as a writer before I would dare to do that. But um, that would be interesting. Um, Diane is a, is a character I really enjoy writing, um, and she would be a possibility for that. I think if the right story crept into my head, I could make that work. So, Thank you all. I, we're, we need to wrap up. We need... Uh, Time enough for the long line to get all their books signed here for Bruce. Um, <laughs> thank you all for coming. Great questions. And I know Bruce is uh, very appreciative of you I just coming. I want to say real quick, um, just as a reminder for those of you that don't know, uh, the third novel will be released on October 30th. Again, it's called Beyond the Truth. And on that very day, we will be uh, having a launch party down at, at DeMillo's. We've taken over the second floor. So it's Tuesday night, October 30th from 5 to 9. Longfellow Books will be there selling copies of the new novel and the first two. And uh, we will be also raising money that night uh, for a program called Canines on the Frontline. Um, and I will tell you before anybody in social media world knows, one of the other things we're going to do that night is we will uh, raffle off or auction off uh, your name as a character in a future novel. So there you go. Thank you guys very much.